The Unshackled Waves, episode 151. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. The biggest news story of the week was of course the royal wedding on Saturday between Prince Harry and American actress Meghan Markle, but there are still plenty of issues of substance that arose throughout the week, including the completion of the Ruddick Review into Religious Freedom, the Royal Commission into Trade Union Corruption's biggest target, the CFMEU Victorian State Secretary John Setka had blackmail charges against him dropped, by the Victorian Director of Public Prosecutions. Donald Trump continues to be plagued by the payment his lawyer made to porn star Stormy Daniels during the campaign, as it has been confirmed that Trump reimbursed his lawyer. To discuss it all, I am joined once again by The Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show again. Thank you, Tim. Now, we uh, finally had the uh, Philip Ruddick uh, Religious uh, Freedom Review handed to the uh, Turnbull government. It was originally supposed to uh, wrap up in March, but because they'd received uh, so many submissions over uh, 16,000 at last count, it was extended until uh, May. Uh, we still don't know, it hasn't been released yet, the, the final details of the report, but it was leaked to the Courier-Mail. Uh, and what it recommends is that uh, religion have the same protections in federal uh, anti-discrimination laws as sexual orientation, race, age, and disability, and also that uh, complaints about uh, religious uh, discrimination, uh, there should be a mechanism through the Australian Human Rights Commission, which is, I think, a bit controversial given how uh, left-leaning the, the commission has been, empowering it to look after religious freedom. Uh, I <laughs> don't have much faith that uh, much is going to come of that. Mm. I'm inclined to agree. I mean, you say left-leaning for the Human Rights Commission, I think staggeringly unbalanced would be a more accurate statement of it. But the problem, I mean, in theory, strengthening the AD laws in regards to religion wouldn't be such a bad idea if it weren't for the fact that we have to contend with uh, Islam as well, which, you know, their religious view on Islam in um, homosexuality in Islam rather is, well, it's not exactly the most kid-friendly story to read to, you, to your children. So, for example, you could have, I mean, this is an extreme example, of course, bear that in mind, but you could have a situation where a, if I'm reading this correctly, if you have um, Islamic persecution of homosexuals, um, LGBTI, etc. how many of the letters it is now, then they could say, ah, but we have, you know, we have the law on our side. This was doing this for religious reasons. And because Islam is a religion intertwined with a political ideology, that's one way they could circumvent the politi the, um, the lack of freedom of political communication which was ruled on recently in the case of the ADF versus Gaynor. I, I doubt that uh, such anti-discrimination laws would uh, empower something which is illegal under uh, Australian law. I mean, to use a more concrete example, I, I doubt that uh, religious anti-discrimination laws would allow child marriage, for example. Oh, I'm not saying allow child marriage. Well, I'm saying, well... Well, no, I'm not. So look, <laughs> I'm not saying we'd allow child marriage, and I'm not going to use that as an example. I, to be honest, I don't think anyone should use that as an example. But um, in regards to persecutions that can happen, if you look at the Human Human Rights Commission, as you pointed out, left leaning, and as I said, more like structurally imbalanced. Then you've got to look at the administrative appeals tribunals as well, which 
essentially kangaroo courts that circumvent the laws and circumvent the spirit of the law to make people um, do things their way and count out to their own agendas. I mean, how many people have been allowed to stay in Australia after the immigration minister, Peter Dunn, wanted to deport them? And so, you know, it's a, it's a, the re that's another, that's the main reason why I'm concerned. I mean, obviously there was the secondary religious reason, but the primary reason is the reason that we have here, um, saying you can't trust the HRC or the AATs, as I call them, to administer the laws properly. I mean, there'll still be persecution. And it's worth keeping in mind because obviously this uh, fr a religious freedom review was uh, done in response to the legalization of uh, same-sex marriage and would uh, Christians uh, begin to be persecuted because they uh, still believe marriage is between a man and a woman even though the law doesn't say that uh, anymore. But the thing is, uh, there was recently that case where that uh, uh, contract uh, that children's uh, party entertainer. She was uh, fired, well, had a contract uh, t terminated because she put up a It's Okay to Vote No banner on Facebook. And the Fair Work Commission said that was okay because it was a political opinion, uh, n uh, nothing to do with uh, religion. So even if there is a strengthening of religious uh, bel uh, belief in the uh, legislation, if that does eventuate, is are the courts going to say no? Uh, traditional marriage is not a religious view; it's a political opinion, and therefore it's not covered. I mean, we, we know well, what the judiciary well. It depends is on like the courts, here. doesn't it? Yeah, that's true. Well, it depends on the judiciary or whoever is sitting on the kangaroo courts of the AATs as well. That's what it comes down to. So you know, in the yeah, so the unfair dismissal suit was um, was thrown out by the Fair Work Commission. But we've had other cases as well um, in the in the mainstream media. Like Israel Folau, the footballer, he has been, after someone sent him a tweet saying, do you think such and such about gays? And he said, well, yes, that is what will happen according to uh, according to the Bible, I think he said, according to his religion or according to the Bible, I forget exactly what he said, but it caused a massive furor and everyone was saying, oh, fire him, sack him. And, you know, recently Land Rover took back a car that they gave him as part of their sponsorship. And so it's like, well, you know, there is persecution and there is certainly advancement of... Uh, how do I put this? There's certainly advancement of a political agenda to impose a certain narrative and manner of thinking upon the population i mean a lot of i mean i mean you remember back in the first days of the plebiscite campaign you will rem remember that um qantas um and qantas and several other businesses i think anz was one of them as well um several other businesses signed a charter saying we support marriage equality and Australia Post certainly did as well actually even though they're an organ of the government they shouldn't have actually been campaigning so did on SBS. that oh well that's well, gee there's a shock um yeah but point is they all signed this charter saying oh we all support marriage equality and we are going to make more inclusive workplaces yada 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 and basically, if you don't have that kind of opinion, the same kind of opinion as us, you're guilty of a thought crime and we're going to fire you and we're going to get away with it because it's a political opinion, not a religious one. Even though in most cases, almost all cases, in fact, Tim, you'll find that most people who say stuff like, for example, it's OK to vote no, will say it because of a theological viewpoint, not because they are trying to be ironically classically liberal and other issues that came up in the uh, debate while this uh, freedom review was uh, underway that it, it wasn't mentioned in its final recommendations or uh, we or we don't know yet is uh, 
uh, whether uh, Christian schools, they'll still be able to uh, fire gay teachers or expel uh, gay students, uh, obviously because having them there uh, would violate uh, their uh, religious uh, values. Mm -hmm, exactly. And it should be noted that the state governments have tried, especially in Queensland, have tried this for quite a while to introduce, um, not introduce, sorry, to remove the exemptions uh, for religious schools in anti-discrimination legislation. Uh, they've tried that on several occasions and they've just failed. They've fallen short most of the time, but come later on this year, I reckon that the Labor government in Queensland will probably brush it through. Um, it's actually also a state matter as well. So in the case of schools, they can say you have to employ people if they are suitably equipped. But so far, the religious exemptions have been, have somewhat protected the schools from major, major litigation. Uh, but as well as that, there was, when the Safe Schools program reared its ugly head uh, more than a year ago, the Shadow Attorney General was, there was a video leaked of the Shadow Attorney General talking with a lot, bunch of campaigners saying, we want you to remove religious protections and religious liberties in this bill. And he said, okay, we're going to work towards that. And if more people had seen that, it's possible that the plebiscite might not have been carried. But at any rate, the point is that religious persecution, there, there are a lot of people who want to engage in religious persecution, or more specifically Christian persecution. Um, sorry to go on a bit of a rant here. It sounds like I'm going on a rant, but, um, uh, um, Bishop Julian Porteous, he is the Arch oh, sorry, Archbishop now, um, I knew him just as Bishop. Our Archbishop Porteous was uh, the Archbishop of Hobart. He wrote, sorry, he authorised a, a pamphlet to be sent to um, the parents of students say, explaining the Catholic position on... Um, marriage, not just same-sex marriage, but marriage in general, all of us saying, you know, saying this is what we Catholics believe. We believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. So one man, one woman, and that's it. So it excludes, doesn't ex just exclude gay marriage, it excludes polyamory, it excludes anything else, it excludes concubinage, it excludes polyandry, polygamy, all of that. So but he was actually dragged before the courts for that, accused of violating human rights, you know, human dignity, causing insult and offence, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so there are people with an agenda who will want to see this bill, who, who don't care if the bill is put in according to the recommendations of the Ruddock Review, because they'll find a way to, you know, make people who have genuine beliefs suffer for it anyway. And uh, John Howard, uh, actually former Prime Minister, said that, uh, that parental rights uh, need to be respected and they should have the right to uh, withdraw their children from sexuality and gender uh, classes uh, under the threat of having their, their funding withdrawn. And uh, it's I, I still can't believe that... Oh, uh, I'm from Victoria, where safe schools program is compulsory in all government schools. The fact that that option is not there. Mm, mm. Well, the parents should have the right, of course, but that's the. Uh, I'm going to sound like a libertarian here for a second, but that's the problem with socialized universal education. Once you have it, the government is going to say, this is what you'll do. There's no no discussions, no debates, no further correspondence will be entered into. This is the way we're going to teach your children. Like it or hate it, this is the way it's going to be. And uh, LGBT activists, they tried to turn this uh, inquiry on its head. Uh, they, of course, uh, want to make uh, safe schools compulsory in every 
single school in the country, not just uh, government schools, but independent religious school, uh, schools, and they want uh, all uh, religious exemptions to anti-discrimination laws uh, scrapped. They're probably going to have a bit more of a difficult time there, given that Labor uh, supports religious exemptions. For now, they support religious exemptions. I'll have to send you that video later on where Mark Dreyfus was caught promising a removal of religious exemptions from any same-sex marriage legislation. This week, the Victorian Director of Public Prosecutions announced it was dropping uh, blackmail charges against uh, CFMEU Victorian State Secretary John Setka and his deputy Sean uh, Reardon. Uh, this was over uh, them uh, threatening uh, borrow uh, executives uh, with a uh, blockade over supplying uh, Grocon, a construction company who the CFMEU was in a dispute with. Now, this was an allegation that came out of the uh, Trade Union uh, Corruption uh, Royal Commission. Uh, now, now that these charges have been dropped, uh, the union's labour uh, claim that this shows the, the Commission and the Coalition Government engaged in a anti-union uh, witch hunt. And probably what uh, sunk this case was the fact that uh, two borrow executives, they changed their statements. One was 41 times and one was 18 times. I and mean, when you have that much revision, it's, yeah, you can sort of understand why the charges were dropped. Yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm no big fan of trade union thuggery, but at the same time, if you've got people in suits changing their statements 18, let alone 40, you say 41 times? Yeah. 41 times, I mean, for goodness sake, come on. Of course the court's going to look, look, this case seems fabricated, the evidence seems fabricated, there may, be, there may have been grounds there but it could end up creating the grounds for a mistrial if we proceed and find them, whether we find them guilty or not guilty is irrelevant. If it's grounds for a mistrial, if the evidence has been tampered with, if testimony is being fabricated. So, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, they did the right thing and having to drop the thing. I mean, yeah, some people are gonna say it's a politically motivated decision and granted it may have been, but they have legal, good legal reasons to drop the case as well. And the, the CFMEU, uh, it's, well, it's actually now the CFMMEU because they merged with the Maritime Union mm. to create the uh, uh, Construction, Forestry, Mining, Maritime and Energy Union. They've uh, paid already $10 million in fines uh, related to uh, this blockade uh, brought by uh, Borrell and the, the ACCC. And, and of course, uh, John Setker, he's, he's no saint. Uh, he actually spent a month in jail in 1990 for uh, contempt for uh, breaking a uh, picket line. And uh, in an interview that was released uh, this week by Sky News, which was embargoed because the case was pending, he defended uh, breaking the law if uh, uh, union activity or what he viewed as legitimate union activity was uh, uh, deemed illegal. And he actually said that all these fines, if they save uh, one worker's life, they're all worth it. Hmm. Well, when you have rhetoric like that, it's hard to it's hard to go against that rhetoric, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you look like you're putting yourself out there for even just one person, it's that kind of messianic attitude that's going to draw people to your side, even if you're not necessarily in favour of trade unionism, period. So, look, at any rate, um, what was I going to say? He spent a month in Pentridge, I believe. Yes. Yes, there. So, and you know who else was in Pentridge? There were a lot of other people in Pentridge as well around that time, um, including Chopper Reed. So, yeah. Maybe he learned a couple of things from Chopper, who knows? Now, Labor has uh, already pledged to uh, uh, abolish the Australian Building and Construction uh, Commission, which uh, they actually uh, got rid of under Rudd and Gillard, but was reinstated by the Turnbull government. That's what we had the 2016 double dissolution election over. And also the Registered Organisation Commission, which uh, came out of the 
Trade Union Royal Commission as well, which has not got off to a, a good start uh, by investigating 10-year-old union donations to get up and uh, uh, botching that with uh, the Employment Minister, uh, Michaela Cash, a uh, uh, staffer in her office tipping off the, the media who uh, cost him his job and Cash is now under uh, AFP uh, in investigation, but that's a, a, a side note. Uh, Labor still hasn't um, succumbed to the other uh, union uh, demands, which is um, more liberal uh, strike laws. And uh, uh, Bill Shorten has said that he'll still accept uh, donations from the CFMMU. Well, that's hardly surprising. I mean, the CFMMEU when it merged, one of their first resolutions passed was expressing solidarity with the socialist Venezuelan regime of El Gordo. Um, sorry, that's his nickname. Uh, Maduro. So, you know, you look at it and you think, just, wow, birds of a feather really stick together. I mean, the CFMEU and the MUA were some of the most notoriously antagonistic and borderline criminal organizations in the country at the time. And I don't think we'll ever know the full extent of their extracurricular activities, but at the same time, um, their support for the regime of Nicolas El Gordo Maduro in Venezuela shows that they don't really care about the people. They just care about their left-wing politics. It's basically communists. I mean, the F the MUA actually gave money to the Greens over the past two federal elections, which is absolutely horrific. And even in so, actually, I'm going to say something here, which I will have to be careful how I phrase the words. So if I seem a little bit slow and disjointed, this is why, because. I have, a, I have a friend of mine inside the Labour Party. Actually, yes, I have friends in the Labour Party. It's a much shock you all, but yes, I do. Um, he was saying to me that he wants to see the CFMEU um, de-affiliated or disaffiliated from the ALP. He wants to see that happen. But he also grudgingly admits that it will never happen because they just bring in so much money to the Labour Party. It's, sorry, I'm sorry, there's one more thing. Um, Labour wants to abolish the ABCC um, and the registered organisation commissions. They want to, they do that, they do this every time. And then the Liberals come back into power and then they eventually restore it anyway. So it's like, well, just leave them there. I mean, you know, leaving them there would suggest that there is no narrative of class war there's no narrative of workers striking illegally there's no narrative of businesses ripping off workers you know it actually allows if you keep them there it actually allows a sensible means of arbitration and conciliation just keep them there well the the coalition government they they haven't had many wins in in IR. I mean, I mentioned uh, what's mm. going on with Michaela Cash at the moment. That's uh, that, That's been botched uh, badly. It seems rather than, because they're still spooked by the work choices loss in 2007, that rather than proposing like just workplace liberal liberalization deregulation there there's this new strategy of well we've got to discredit the the trade union movement uh, by any means uh, necessary and that's why they're getting these accusations of a witch hunt rather than uh, just like like i mentioned just looking at ways to you know better uh, have better workplace laws they they're, they're trying this other approach and it, and it just looks like a a partisan or well, basically political persecution. Mm, indeed, Tim. And it looks even worse considering that Malcolm Turnbull was the richest prime minister we've ever had with a net worth of just under $200 million last I checked. So it doesn't look good when you've got a rich man, a uh, harborside mansion, as, um, as Peter Credlin referred to him once in a very glib attack. It doesn't make it doesn't look good when you've got a rich man attacking the 
um, the unions who are supposed to stick up for the workers. It looks bad. And it also also leads to the possibility that people will turn a blind eye to uh, some of the more muscular activities of the uh, unions in terms of defending their workers' rights. Over to the United States, and Stormy Daniels continues to cause quite a political storm, to uh, use a pun. Now, who is Stormy Daniels? She's a, a porn star who uh, alleges she had an affair with uh, Donald Trump in 2006, while uh, shortly after his uh, current wife, Melania, gave birth to their son, Barron. Uh, now, in the 2016 presidential campaign, Trump's uh, personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, paid her $130,000 to uh, keep quiet. However, Trump ally, or he's not really an ally, uh, now Rudy Giuliani blurted out uh, in the media that uh, Trump reimbursed Cohen for this uh, payment. And of course, this has uh, got the attention of Special Prosecutor uh, Robert Mueller, who uh, our deputy editor, uh, Emilio Garcia, has uh, told me that Mueller is not just interested in Russia, but he's also got jurisdiction to basically investigate anything about Trump's business dealings or obstruction uh, of justice. And so, again, this is allegedly the smoking gun which is going to bring down his uh, presidency, but it's just another unwelcome distraction which the, the media is pouncing upon. Hmm, exactly. I mean, Guy had an affair with a porn star while his wife had just after his wife had just given birth to a child and wasn't exactly you know to put it bluntly not exactly interested in you know nocturnal activities. So it's just so what you know people have affairs all the time. I mean, I'm not saying it's right. I would definitely never. In, never countenance affairs but you know it happens they happen you've got a man like trump who has a significant ego you can guess his drive is going to be somewhat commensurate to that and of course he's going to have an affair and yeah you know i mean it's not like there was any issues of consent i mean obviously she agreed to have the affair Otherwise, it wouldn't be such a big scandal. Otherwise, it wouldn't be such a big scandal. But so it's a porn star. She gets paid money to have sex, and uh, everyone's saying, "Oh, come on, you shouldn't have had an affair." Well, of course, you shouldn't have had the affair. But it's not like she's a saint either. Come on. And yeah, I, I, I agree that yeah, having an affair is yeah, immoral, but. We knew Trump's uh, background uh, when he was running for uh, the pre presidency and we chose to uh, put it to one side because he was talking good on uh, immigration and, and national security. Like, so when this comes out, it's like, yeah, we already knew that you know, Trump was like this. I mean, the Access Hollywood tape came out before he, w he was elected. But uh, uh, Stormy Daniels, uh, she seems to be doing quite well. Nobody knew who she was until uh, this uh, she made this uh, allegation and she's uh, in the media all the time, obviously probably making a bit of money from speaking engagements and got a guest spot on uh, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> the cynic in me wants to say that she broke faith. Given the way you could say she broke faith in terms of, you know, actually saying after the election, oh, by the way, I slept with the President of the United States. The cynic in me wants to say she did that because she wanted to boost her career. I mean, she's pretty old. I mean, even for the porn industry, she's quite old. She's, I think I saw she was 39. Yeah, she's 39 years old. So, you know, what are you going to do? If you're a, an older performer in, in, in any industry, not just porn, pornography, but in any industry in general, what are you going to do? You're going to find a way to stay ahead of the competition of your co and of your co-workers so what are you going to do you're going to say something sensational and you're going to get an inevitable boost in followers and watches and ratings as a result that's what that's what the cynic in me says is that she's done that just for that purpose she's made the she's leaked about her affair with trump just to make more money just to get ahead or, res or, or 
go to head <laughs> to <laughs> resume her place. Um, to resume her place in um, the higher ranks of performing porn stars. Now, uh, Michael Cohen, Trump's uh, personal lawyer, uh, uh, Mueller's already gone uh, after uh, him. Uh, he's he's uh, facing an investigation of bank fraud and uh, campaign uh, violations, and there was the the FBI uh, raid as well. Uh, so, yeah, they, they can still potentially get Trump on these uh, you know vi violations of laws. But whether this is I, I I mean, you know, political payoffs like like this, they're they're, they're commonplace to you know make a mistress uh, uh, go away. Uh, uh, but uh, but of course, you know, if there's you know if if a law has been broken, there's a mechanism for them to. Oh, oh when I say them, I mean the media and uh, Mueller and all the other enemies of Trump to to finally get him. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, because I remember reading somewhere that the payment from the lawyer to Stormy Daniels was not in of itself an offence because it was unconnected to the campaign funds. But when Giuliani dropped his bombshell and said, oh yeah, Trump re reimbursed Cohen, that, that did create a new window of opportunity for an attack by the special prosecutor or as far as special counsel. And the thing was, you know, I mean, okay, I'm not a lawyer, but you look at saying a client's going to pay a lawyer for services rendered. Yes. So you'd say that there's, you know, that's just a professional transaction. There's nothing illegal about that unless there is a motive to conspiracy, for example. But uh, even more was quoted as saying, the problem is not with his payment to Stormy Daniels to conceal the affair. With the the uh, issues are with other unrelated campaigning matters. Now, probably the biggest media frenzy of the week was the uh, royal wedding of uh, Prince Harry marrying American actress uh, Meghan uh, Markle. Now, it's it's considered a key event in the history of the the British. Uh, monarchy. Even though uh, uh, Prince Harry now he's he's not the heir to the throne. He's he's sixth in the the line of succession. It's uh, he'll never uh, become king. But he's always uh, had uh, a lot of uh, paparazzi interest, given his uh, youthful uh, antics, his uh, fancy dress and uh, partying and uh, without <laughs> much clothes on as. Uh, has endeared him to the world media, and plus the the fact that he was marrying a uh, Hollywood, or oh, somewhat of a Hollywood uh, celebrity, it was a media match uh, made, made in heaven. Uh, but uh, uh, another angle to this is uh, the the media, especially the the leftist media, who normally don't like the the monarchy. They've called the wedding historic because uh, Meghan Markle, she's half black. Uh, she was. Uh, born a uh, Catholic, uh, she's American, and she's a divorcee as well, and so this is considered progressive uh, monarchy. Mm hmm. Well, as you know, Tim, I'm a traditionalist, so I opposed the I opposed the marriage on um, traditional grounds. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, good on them. if they're happy, they're happy, good on them. But at the same time, I don't think it should have been done. I mean, you've got to remember back in 1936 when uh, Edward VIII, who later became Edward Duke of Windsor, um, was forced to abdicate. He, he was forced to abdicate because he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee. Um, well, granted, it's different because Edward was the king. Edward was the next in line to be king. And then, he, in fact, he was king for uh, roughly nine months. But any marriage would have been prevented, would have been ruled as a morganatic marriage, and any children that he would have had would not have been considered uh, as heirs to the throne. So he still would have gone to his brother Albert, who became George the Sixth. Anyway, 
But Churchill, who was one of the leading politicians at that time, he wasn't prime minister at the time, but he was one of the leading politicians. He actually supported, he and quite a few others actually supported the right of um, Edward Duke of Windsor to marry Wallace Simpson. But the majority did not, especially in the House of Lords, they did not support that. Now, the interesting thing is that the fact that um, His Royal Highness Prince Harry, Duke of Sussex, as he's now being titled, is married an American divorcee. It's, even though he's not, he's only sixth in line to the throne, so he can marry who he likes now. Uh, since his nephew Louis was born, he can marry whomever he likes. But he just. It makes him it makes him awkward of the sacrament of marriage. I mean, you know, if you're going to be part of the royal family, which the, so the, lead, the leader of the royal family is the supreme governor of the Church of England, and you're marrying a, and you're allowing one of your brood to marry a divorcee, with all due respect to Her Majesty, it's a very grave error in judgment. Not just as a secular monarch, but also as the um, governor of the church as well. Well, the reason why this is permissible now, and there, there, there hasn't been a big uh, controversy like there was in 1936, is basically because of the disaster of Prince Charles and Princess Diana, where uh, uh, Prince Charles, you know, his real soulmate was Camilla Parker Bowles, but he was instructed to marry Diana as the more socially acceptable uh, princess, and of course they were a complete mismatch for each other. It ended in a spectacular uh, se separation, and of course um, now that uh, Charles is with Camilla, he eventually declared his relationship with her uh, non-negotiable, and they've been happy together uh, ever since. There, there's sort of been a lesson in uh, royal history that if a prince, you know, loves you know, somebody that's probably the most important thing rather than who is the socially acceptable one. Yeah, but at the same time, you don't... Oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm a bit hardline, maybe I'm a bit of a fuddy-duddy here, but, you know, you don't want to have... You don't marry a divorcee. It's not going to end well. I mean, she's had what... How many marriages has Meghan Markle had previously? I think it's just the one. Just the one, you know. Well, obviously, you know, a divorcee is a divorcee, but the more marriages you have, the more likely they are going to end in divorce. So, and, you know, she's... Look, I, 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 I sound bitter and I sound like I, I'm hostile towards them. I'm definitely not. But it's just, there are some things that just aren't done. And there are just some things that should not be done. And this is one of them. A marriage between a royal and a commoner is not so much of a problem, but she's not only a commoner, she's a foreigner. She's divorced. And in this case, she's actually a little bit older than him, which isn't usually a criterion for, you know, if, if I were single and considering a partner, that wouldn't be a problem for me. But in this case, it's not... It doesn't fit the traditional mold very well. And you know, a lot of other people who have other reasons for opposing the marriage, in addition to my reasons. Um, I won't go into those, but you've probably heard some of them. But it's just, you just look at it and say, no, we, we, do, we don't, we don't think it's, a pro we don't think it's appropriate. It's just, you know, and everyone's going on about, oh, it's unprecedented because the first racial um interracial royal marriage is like well maybe may, it may be the first well the first in the western world that we know of we should be clear or at least in the british speaking world um the fact is in regards to the religious issues as well i mean you know you said she was born a catholic did i hear you say she was a yes. born catholic yeah mm. Yeah, well, she well she apostatized. It's just so. Let me rephrase that. She converted it to Church of England. Yes, yeah, she to had to, to marry. marry. Exactly, and you know, thinking yeah, converting to the Anglican Church from the Catholic Church 
all the while knowing that you are divorced. Although she, I do also recall reading somewhere that she converted to Judaism briefly as well, when she was married to her ex-husband. Uh, the, the problem that I have uh, with Meghan Markle is not the fact that she's divorced, it's just that her uh, family is problematic. Her father, uh, Thomas Markle, he was busted uh, staging uh, paparazzi shots, which he uh, received $100,000 for. So he is basically trying to capitalize on uh, his, uh, da his uh, daughter's uh, marriage into the royal family. And then there's uh, Megan's sister, Samantha Grant, who has written a book uh, talking uh, about uh, her sister and uh, has gone on all the talk shows. And uh, I really, uh, when he's not talking about uh, guns, Piers Morgan, he's actually uh, quite a good interviewer, said, like, you're talking about media vultures. You're the biggest media vulture there is. It's, yeah, her, fa her family doesn't paint her in a positive light. And uh, uh, a lot of people are wondering whether Thomas Markle, whether he was too sick to go to the wedding or whether he was quietly told to uh, stay away. Well, I heard something saying that he didn't actually want to be at the wedding anyway, and he was actually hoping that the wedding would be called off. So if he gave the invitation, if he declined the invitation saying, oh, I'm too sick, he's probably his polite way of saying, no, I don't want anything to do with you. A lot of, it, it, as you've pointed out, Tim, a lot of people in Meghan Markle's family have been very critical of her and said some, well, not very nice things, you could say. So, I don't know. Maybe there's, maybe there's truth to it. Maybe they're just jealous of her. Who knows? But the too but the too long didn't read version of all of the royal wedding is uh, the media love to celebrate celebrities and the royal family the royal families of the world but especially of the united kingdom and of australia they are amongst the biggest celebrities of all by default simply because of their bloodline and everyone is always going to go, well, not everyone, but a lot of people, especially in the mainstream media, however, are going to go nuts over it because it's fun. It's cool. They're spending God knows how much money on it. And, well, actually, that's a lie. They're spending, they spend about $30 million on the wedding. Sorry, 30 million pounds. Sorry, I beg your pardon. On the wedding. And it's a lot of money. That's, that's as much as the Queen gets paid through the civil list each year for her services to the United Kingdom and indeed all of her other realms. So it's just, it's just, you know, it's exciting and the media loves to sensationalize things. And that's why we are here to, you know, cut through the crap, pardon my language. Well, it's, it's been seen as a boost for the monarchy, uh, this uh, wedding, and uh, there was endless commentary on the, on the wedding last night on all the, the major news networks, and the argument is that uh, William and Harry have sort of rehabilitated the, the monarchy's image after the, the scandals of the, the 90s, and uh, I'd certainly say uh, in, a, in Australia, the, the Republican movement there, uh, they've got an uphill battle, I mean, because the the, the royal family, they're, well, they're, they're not just popular in Australia, they're popular worldwide, and uh, mm -hmm. the Australians, they, they won't mind the fact that, you know, they have a, a slice in it, and uh, they'll get uh, regular visits from William, Harry, and, and, and the others, and uh, there mm -hmm. was uh, royal wedding uh, parties last night all throughout uh, Australia, the streets were uh, deserted, so yeah, it's, it's it certainly seems that everyone was in Australia was uh, exci excited about it, and there's even though uh, Labor has uh, pledged they'll have a plebiscite on the Republic if they win the next election, I'd sort of say good luck to them with that. <laughs> yes, we only need to look at 1999 and how it, the referendum proposal was defeated in every single state. The only who, 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 who was the, the leader of that campaign? Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> As Bronwyn Bishop said, and I think I said this to you in a phone call as well, uh, there was a video when um, Bronwyn Bishop and Malcolm Turnbull were debating Monarchy vs. Republic for some Liberal Party event. And she makes the comment, Pearl Driven is our Malcolm. And 
yes, obviously he is. I mean, case in point, 30 news polls that were negative for Tony Abbott. He makes his move and, you know, plunges that knife into his back. But um, yeah, every, anyway, my point was that apart from the ACT, every jurisdiction, state and territory, voted no to the proposal. Then the interesting thing about the Australian Constitution as well is that you have to have not only majority of voters federally, you also have to have a majority of states. So even if, say, New South Wales and Victoria voted yes for a republic back then, if the other four states had not, it wouldn't matter. We'd still remain a constitutional monarchy anyway. Yeah, it's, I mean, if you can't win in uh, 1999 when the, the movement was at, at its strongest, it's, mm. you're going to have a difficult time uh, kick-starting uh, the, the movement again. Exactly, plus Peter Fitzsimmons is probably, the, is probably, does, probably does more damage to the Republican cause than, than even Prince Harry marrying Meghan Markle or Prince William marrying Kate Middleton, for example. Oh, that's that, that. That's your opinion on that. We know that you're very. <laughs> you've made it clear that you're very uh, traditionalist, but hey, everyone else is was pretty excited about it. Uh, but uh, that caps off uh, what was a uh, quite a interesting uh, news week. Uh, it's <laughs> it's going to get a lot more uh, wild as the as the year goes by, and um, I'm sure we'll be back uh, next week and the week after to uh, see what's happened then. Definitely. Thanks for having me on, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There are some big events coming up in Melbourne, which I would like to encourage all of you to attend. The first is the No Snowflakes Pub Night, hosted by Avi Yemeni and Sydney Watson. It is on Friday the 1st of June at 7pm and will be held in the South Yarra area. Tickets are free and can be booked via Eventbrite. The True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March is nearly upon us. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there this year. The date is Sunday the 24th of June at 12pm and begins at the Royal Exhibition Building. The Campaign Against Racism and Fascism will be there to counter-protest, so we'll also witness the feral left in action. Diane Colbert from the All Nations Christian Mental Health Association, who was a speaker at the Rally Against Safe Schools we covered, is speaking speaking at the Family Values Alliance in Ballarat at their event titled LGBTQI Myths and Facts. It is on Friday the 25th of May at 7pm at The Shed in Sebastopol, Ballarat. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks for once in for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.